Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin by thanking the Microbiology Society for this great honor. When I look at the list of the previous recipients of this honor, I'm very humbled to be among the honorees. So thank you again. Today, I will be speaking about antibiotics at the crossroads. My talk will have five, point, five points. Here's part one, the problem. Why have many diseases increased in recent decades? This slide shows examples of three of them. Juvenile diabetes, doubling every 20 or 25 years. Diseases of the esophagus, like reflux, increasing dramatically. Asthma going through the roof. And we could add to that obesity, IBD, celiac disease, food allergies, atopy, attention disorder. So if 10 diseases are going up at the same time, do they have 10 different causes? Or is it possible that one cause underlies them all? I wanna focus first on obesity. This slide looks at obesity trends in US adults. It's a kind of changing physiology. And I'm using data from the CDC. This slide shows three maps of the United States from 1989 to 2010. In 1989, there is no state in the United States where more than 14% of adults are obese. By 2010, there is no state with less than 20% obesity and the national average exceeded 30%. Now, what's significant about this slide is that it's happening everywhere, all over the country. And in fact, the difference between the first map and the last map is only 21 years. Something very powerful must be going on. Now, obesity in adults begins in childhood. And here we look at obesity trends among US children and adolescents. Um, these are data from the NHANES over about a 35 year period. And we're looking at the percentage of overweight and obese children. And you can see which way the trend line is going, even in the youngest children. Now here are worldwide trends of overweight and obese children, according to socioeconomic development. You see the curve in developed countries, and you see that the rates are lower in developing countries, but they're going up as well. And if we think about where the developing countries are going, they're very similar to where we were, but it indicates that it's the same trajectory, but with a 30-year lag. Now, these are, these are the rates of overweight. How about the global numbers of overweight and obese children? And here we see a somewhat different story. Now we see that most of the children in the world who are overweight are in developing countries. And that's because that's where most of the children in the world live. And by, by around now, we have about 50 million overweight and obese children under the age of five. And as you can see, the numbers are going up. So how could we understand what's going on? Here, I'd like to discuss some theory. And I want to bring in the microbiome. Mothers have been transferring microbes to their children since time immemorial. We humans are mammals. We begin life in a womb that is sterile or mostly sterile. Our first big exposure to microbes happens when the water breaks. And the, we descend through the birth canal. We're covered by mom's microbes. We swallow those microbes. Then the skin-to-skin -skin contact, mom and baby, the baby's mouth full of microbes inoculates the breast and microbes and substrate become the foundation of the gastrointestinal microbiota for the next generation. Moms are kissing and licking babies. Lots of redundant pathways for transferring the microbes from one generation to the other. This is the way it's always been done in all mammals. It goes back almost a hundred million years. But now, life is different. Moms aren't the same as they were. Moms are living in a world with antisepsis. They've taken antibiotics. They're receiving antibacterials in their diet. And babies aren't the same as well. They may be born by cesarean section. They may miss 
the passage through the birth canal. In the United States, one baby out of three is born by C-section. In some countries, it's higher. Babies are bathed extensively. They're fed formula, which only superficially resembles uh, human breast milk. And they get lots of medications, especially antibiotics, which I'll be talking about. So on the basis of these kinds of ideas, over the last 20 years, I've been developing an idea that I call the theory of disappearing microbiota. This theory has two major tenets. First, that changed human ecology has altered transmission and maintenance of ancestral microbes, which affects the composition of the microbiota. And second, that the microbes, both bad and good, usually acquired early in life are especially important since they affect a developmentally critical stage. Now, about 10 years ago uh, with Professor Stan Falco, we enlarged this hypothesis and as shown here, the effect of maternal status on the resident microbiota of the next generation. Our idea is that ancient moms uh, used to have a conserved microbiota, which they would pass on to the next generation. If, if they lost microbes and couldn't get them back horizontally, then the next generation would be born at a deficit and so on and so forth. And this is what we have postulated has been happening over the 20th and now into the 21st century. Each generation is starting out with a more and more diminished microbiota. Now, unfortunately, there is more and more evidence that this is correct. Here, we're looking at the prevalence of Helicobacter pylori in three generations in Japanese families. Until recently, Helicobacter pylori was the dominant organism in the human gastric microbiota. And you can see here the same kind of step down that we have postulated. We can also, that looked at a specific organism, we can look across all the organisms in the intestinal tract and this is from work of Jose Clemente and colleagues, looking at four different populations of, of humans, uh, uh, kids in the US, uncontacted Amerindians in the Amazon, and two, uh, two village societies. And when we look at the total diversity in their microbiota, the highest diversity are in the uncontacted, intermediate in the villagers, lowest in the industrialized US. And so we can see evidence for this step down in, in microbial diversity, and other studies have confirmed our data. So what could be causing this? Well, I think, as I pointed out, that it is multifactorial, but I want to focus now on antibiotics, which we all recognize as one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. Here's uh, Sir Alexander Fleming, uh, one of the great pioneers uh, in antibiotics, uh, the discoverer of penicillin. He's reenacting his discovery of penicillin. Uh, and he, of course, was the founder of this society. Since the 19, late 1940s, antibiotics have been in universal use around the world. They have saved innumerable lives. They have re revolutionized every aspect of medicine. But as a result of their great properties, Practitioners all over the world have been using antibiotics more and more and more. How much more? Well, a recent estimate was greater than 73 billion antibiotic doses worldwide every year. That's more than 10 antibiotic pills for every man, woman, and child on earth, and the numbers are going up. In the United States, the CDC has counted the number of antibiotic courses. In 2010, it was 258 million courses. That's 833 courses per thousand population. That, uh, that's five courses for every six people, and it's been going on year after year. In children, uh, in the first two years of life, based on the CDC data, they're getting nearly three courses of antibiotics. By the time they're 10, they get 10 courses of antibiotics. During pregnancy, more than 50% are treated with antibiotics or given prophylaxis. There's also exposure to antibiotics from use of antibiotics on a farm. We don't even know the magnitude of this. Now, this slide looks at the variation in per capita antibiotic prescribing in 31 European countries. 
from the Netherlands at the lowest rate to Greece at the highest rate, there's more than a threefold difference in per capita antibiotic prescribing. But there is no threefold difference in serious bacterial infections. This reflects differences in practice and culture. How about antibiotic use in developing countries? Well, here is antibiotic use in the first two years of life among children in the mal-ed birth cohorts. These were established by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They looked at more than 2,000 children in the first two years of life. That's the x-axis here. The y-axis is antibiotic courses per person year. I've drawn in this blue line, which is antibiotic use in the first two years of life in US children. And you can see that almost in almost all of these countries, antibiotic use is higher than in the US, including in Bangladesh and Pakistan, where in these studies, children in the first year of life were getting more than 10 courses of antibiotics. You might ask, how is that possible? Well, these children uh, have parents who love them. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they have a fever or a cough, they go to the local pharmacist, the pharmacist is happy to sell them an antibiotic. So antibiotic use in many parts of the world is greater in developing countries than in developed countries. So we're all concerned about the ecological effects of antibiotic exposures. And I draw it like the proverbial iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is antibiotic resistance. We've known about this since Fleming talked about it in his Nobel prize speech in 1945. But I draw the body of the iceberg as the effects of antibiotics disrupting the microbiome, which can lead to clinical consequences. The disruption can be transient or long-term. It can be developmental, situational, senescent, or generational. The effects can be immunologic, metaplastic, neoplast metabolic, neoplastic, or maternal. I'll talk about several of these. Part three, evidence of correlation of early life antibiotic exposure and subsequent disease risk. Many studies have looked at cohorts of children and looked at relationships with antibiotic use. I'm gonna show you a study that I was involved in uh, with colleagues at the Mayo Clinic to examine uh, uh, these effects. So this was a study of all the children born in Olmsted County, Minnesota, where the Mayo Clinic is located, to assess the association of early life antibiotic exposure with disease outcome. We're concerned about the period of antibiotic exposure, especially in the first two years of life, and then we look at disease outcome. In total, 18,000 children were born in Olmsted County during the study period. We studied about 14,000. The details are in this paper. Here are the characteristics of study children relative to antibiotic exposure in the first two years of life. In total of the 14,000 kids, there were 10,000 who received antibiotics in the first two years of life and about 4,000 who didn't. The study is split evenly between boys and girls and the uh, number of prescriptions in those receiving antibiotics was one to two or three to four or some had five or more courses. And the three major classes of antibiotics were penicillins, cephalosporins, and macroloids. Now here I'll show you a Kaplan-Meier plot of the time to developing asthma by sex and by antibiotic exposure. Here, this plot begins at the age of two. The exposure period is over. Now we're looking at cases of, of asthma. Here's the probability of asthma. The red lines are girls. These are girls who did not receive antibiotics in the first two years of life. These are girls who did. Here are boys without antibiotics. Here are boys with. You can see that both of these curves have been shifted upward. This is consistent with many other studies. In fact, we looked at 10 common health conditions, um, inflammatory and allergic conditions, metabolic conditions, and neuropsychiatric conditions. And here we're looking at the adjusted hazard ratio. Uh, hazard ratio of one is neutral. Antibiotic exposure had no, effect, no relationship to the later outcome. But we can see that for all of these, these are shifted above one. And in fact, for eight of the 10, they are statistically significant. So we can summarize this result here. This study showed 
in, in work that, that is in the publication, which I haven't had a chance to show completely today, is that antibiotic exposure, number of courses, timing of the exposure, and specific antibiotic class were associated with specific subsequent risk for eight important childhood diseases. So here we're looking at all of them together, and this complements the work where scientists have been looking at single events alone. Now that is correlational. Part four is to look at causal roles for antibiotic-induced perturbation. And this work for me began with the understanding that farmers have been using antibiotics for the last 70 years to fatten up their farm animals. This procedure is, is called growth promotion. Farmers are using it from chickens to cows so that they can bring their animals to market earlier. It, growth promotion works for just about any antibacterial that uh, has been tried, regardless of its chemical structure, its class, its target, or its spectrum. Antivirals do not work, antifungals do not work. Importantly, the earlier in life the antibiotic is started, the higher the effect on growth rate the higher the effect on feed efficiency, the conversion of food calories to body mass. This is what farmers are trying to do. So we began to do studies looking at the development of mice who we gave antibiotics or not. We examined their properties. We examined the microbiome and looked for relationships. And our hypothesis is that antibiotics were affecting early life development. So here were our first studies. This was done by Il Sung Cho when he was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. Here we're looking at body fat in antibiotic exposed and controlled 10-week-old uh, mice. Mice were given uh, antibiotics uh, at, at the midpoint of the FDA regulated dose on the farm or not. And here we're looking at percent body fat. And the mice that received antibiotics were putting on more fat than the controls. And you can see this kind of example. This was our first evidence that antibiotics are changing metabolism in the mice. We did, Ilsung did many other studies, but I want to move ahead to the next study, which was done by Lori Cox when she was a graduate student in the lab. Lori asked, are the changes due to antibiotics durable, even if the exposure is limited? So in addition to a group of mice that re re didn't receive any antibiotics and received lifetime antibiotics, she had a group that had got only eight weeks of antibiotics or only four weeks of antibiotics. Here we're looking at the effects on, on body uh, total mass, lean mass, and fat mass. The black line is the control group. What we found is that all three antibiotic exposures increased total mass, increased lean mass, and increased format, uh, uh, fat mass. So four weeks beginning at the beginning of life was sufficient for the full effect. We were also interested in the effects of these subtherapeutic antibiotics, or STAT, on intestinal uh, lymphocyte populations. Here we're looking at TH17 populations. And this is work that Jackie Leung did in Pung Lok's lab. We're looking here at the small intestine or the large intestine by flow cytometry. No matter how we look at it, markers of TH17 cells are down in all populations. And this has been a very consistent finding. Well, what about the microbiome? So here we're looking at fecal community structure in the mice when they're three weeks old. And at three weeks, there are essentially two groups of mice, control mice not receiving antibiotics, and all the antibiotic mice are still receiving the antibiotics. So here's a principal coordinates analysis. Each circle represents one mouse, black is control, orange is uh, had received the antibiotic. So you can see there's a lot of diversity in, uh, in, in what we find in these populations of mice. And, and the two groups largely overlap, but they're a little different, which is not surprising because one group is receiving antibiotics and the other is not. Now we're going to turn to eight weeks. And this is actually a very important slide because now we have three groups of mice. Uh, the uh, control mice, no antibiotics, or two groups had continued antibiotics, but we have one group that received antibiotics and then stopped. So now when we look at the populations, the black circles are the control, 
The orange circles are continued antibiotics. They're more far apart than before, not surprising. They're continuing to receive antibiotics. But the, the group that received antibiotics and stopped, their microbiota have reverted to normal. So this means that the antibiotic effect was transient on the microbiome, but the effect on the phenotype in the mice was permanent. And this provides evidence that altering the microbiota during a critical developmental stage has long-term consequences. So was this a microbiota effect or was it just an indirect effect from the antibiotics? So to test that hypothesis, we did a, a microbial transfer. From mice that received antibiotics or not, we harvested the microbiota from their cecum, and we gave these to germ-free mice. These are mice that had never seen bacteria. And, and we now conventionalize them, and we follow them for, for five weeks. And I'll remind you that these mice never saw an antibiotic. So now we're looking at these recipient mice at their total lean and fat mass. The black line is the control group. What we found is that the antibiotic perturbed microbiota caused these mice to increase, uh, increase their total mass. There was no effect on the lean mass, but there was an effect on their fat mass. So here we show that the signal is in the altered microbiota, and it's a metabolic signal. So next we asked, how about, uh, are there immunological signals? So here we're looking at expression of genes involved in intestinal defenses, in the microbiota of donor and recipient mice. First, we look at the donor mice. We're looking at genes related to Th17 or antimicrobial peptides downstream of Th17, like the transcription factor to cytokines. So in the control mice, we have high levels of all expression of these genes, but in the mice that receive the antibiotics, the levels are lower as we had come to expect. This was our expected result. But now we ask what's gonna to happen to the recipient mice that receive the perturbed microbiota or the control microbiota. And here we see the same trends as we see above. So the, the altered microbiota is transferring the immunological phenotype as well. Now we continue to do this work uh, looking at a model of juvenile diabetes, one of those increasing diseases. This is work done in NOD mice that spontaneously developed type 1 diabetes. And this is work that Shusong Zhang did uh, in the lab. And here, mice were given either three courses of antibiotics or one course of antibiotics or not. And then we monitored their, their diabetes. Here's the Kaplan-Meier analysis of their type 1 incident. The blue lines are the control mice. They are spontaneously developing uh, antibi uh, type 1 diabetes as expected. But the mice that receive the antibiotics they're getting into type 1 earlier and to a greater extent. So in this model, the antibiotic exposure enhanced the type 1 diabetes. We did many studies here, but we're, here we're particularly interested in how did the antibiotic exposure affect gene expression in the intestinal wall, in the ileum. So we're looking here at differential toll-like receptor signaling pathway expression, how these genes mature over time in young uh, mice. And these are all the genes in the TLR signaling pathway. And genes in color are genes that are differentially affected by the antibiotic exposure versus the control. And you can see that the effects are quite profound. Now, the final uh, experiment in this series that I want to show you has to do with in inflammatory bowel disease. First, let me show you that the likelihood of IBD in Danish children by early life antibiotic exposure. These investigators looked at all the children born in Denmark over a nine year period. And what they showed is that the more courses of antibiotics they received in the first year of life, the more likely they were to develop IBD. So there is, there is some epidemiologic basis of this. So we then asked, can antibiotic altered microbiota affect IBD outcome? But we studied it in the next generation. We studied it in, wild, in conventional wild type mice or in IL-10 deficient mice. These are mice that spontaneously develop colitis. This work was done by Angel Schulfer when she was a graduate student in the lab. Angel conventionalized pregnant germ-free mice to examine effects on, on, on the next generation. 
So she gave mice either control microbiota or an antibiotic perturbed microbiota. And these mice were germ-free pregnant mice. So she had two genotypes of mice, wild type or IL-10, two inoculous. She had four different groups of mice. They were conventionalized. In due course, they all gave birth to their pups. And then we studied these pups all the way to age 21 weeks of life till they were middle-aged. And we asked two questions. What was the effect of the perturbed microbiota on the ecology of the, mi of the microbiome in the next generation? And what were the effects on disease? There were many effects on ecology, and you'll have to read the paper to see them. I'm going to focus on disease. So here we're looking at colonic pathology in IL-10 knockout pups at week 21, according to the microbiota to which their mothers were exposed. Here's the colon in, in a mouse whose mother received the control microbiota. There's colitis here, as we expect in IL-10 mice at 21 weeks. But in the pup whose mom received the antibiotic perturbed microbiota, there's much more inflammation. And this, this difference is highly significant. So to summarize this experiment, let me remind you that neither pups nor their mother received antibiotics. That means that the enhanced disease signal that we saw was entirely microbial. What that means is that antibiotic effects can cross generations. It also means that inheritance is not just based on host genes, but it is based on microbes and their genes as well. So let me summarize what I've said thus far. Antibiotics have long-term effects on metabolism and immunity. The effects are due to perturbing the microbiome. There are other effects of modern life that also might contribute, and I haven't discussed these. The effects may be transmitted to the next generation. And it's important that we need to find and implement solutions. So part five, hope. So how are we going to solve this problem? Well, one piece of it is that we have to cur curtail the unnecessary use of antibiotics. The variability that I showed you before is one, one piece of evidence of how much uh, uh, antibiotic use is unnecessary. But also, even if we curtailed all necessary use, we, we have to begin to restore the microbiota. So let me go back to the type one experiments that Xu Song Zhang did. Now he did an experiment to see, could he rescue the phenotype? So here we're looking at the effects of sequel microbiota transfer on type one development in NOD mice. In addition to control mice and mice who received uh, uh, antibiotics, he had a third group who after getting the antibiotics, he gave them mom sequel microbiota back. Here's the Kaplan-Meier curve. The blue line is the control group, no antibiotics. The red line is the group that received antibiotics. It's significantly more uh, diabetes than the controls as expected. But if those who got antibiotics then got mom sequel microbiota, it almost restored them to baseline. And so this shows that restoration can work. We have looked at many different aspects in this experiment. I'll just show you one, which looks at differential ileal gene expression in relation to restoration. This was an RNA-seq of the ileum in 23-day-old pups. We have the three groups I told you about. And here we're looking at an unsupervised hierarchical clustering. Each column is one mouse. So the mice that received antibiotics cluster by themselves. Here are the control mice. They're a second cluster. And the mice that received antibiotics and then mom sequel contents, their gene expression is clustering with control. For all these genes, we have restored the control pattern of gene expression. So restoration is possible phenotypically. And now we know some of the target genes that are involved. So an overview of this study is that this, this work, this restoration strategy, provides a pathway for discovering microbes, microbial genes, metabolites, and host genes that are perturbed by antibiotics, and in this case, that drive autoimmunity, and that also can be restored. And this will give us our candidates for our future studies. So my projection of medicine in the future is that pediatricians are going to examine babies, and they're going to examine their diapers. And they're going to 
analyze, does this baby have the global microbes that all babies should have? Do they have the personal microbes that a baby of this genotype and biomarker should have? And if they don't, they're going to reach into their armamentarium and administer those particular microbes early in life so that the baby can be restored and, and monitor these babies and potentially reshape the microbiome, assaying to ask, is this working? Are we gonna put the baby on the best pathway for their future development? Now, where will the doctors of the future get these microbes since so many of them are disappearing? I'd like to tell you about the Microbiota Vault, which is a global nonprofit effort to conserve long-term health for humanity. We're setting up a, a system to store disappearing microbiota from developing countries before they disappear. You can read about it in our paper in Science or go to our website. This is being led by Maria Gloria dominguez Bale with an international group of uh, uh, board members. Finally, I want to finish this talk by recognizing the many people who've done the, the experimental work that I've talked about today. I've tried to point out the ones who did particular experiments, but we, it's a great uh, young international team. Many other people helped with different aspects and lots of support from, different, uh, from the US government and different foundations. And so I'll just finish by thanking everyone again for this opportunity to speak and for the great honor of this prize. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. Many congratulations on your award. Fantastic, thank you. Unfortunately, Karen Robinson and Georgina Hall, who had nominated Professor Blazer, are unable to join us today. So Marguerite Klein and I have stepped in. Marguerite has a strong interest in Helicobacter pylori and I work on the human microbiota. So I do hope that we can fill their shoes as we ask some of the questions that Karen Robinson had formulated. So I'll pass you over to Marguerite to start off on Helicobacter. So Martin, thank you for that talk. So Helicobacter is disappearing in the modern world and it probably was starting to disappear by the time we discovered it probably. Do you think that was due to the use of antibiotics or other factors such as improve sanitation? Well, let me just begin also by thanking uh, uh, Karen and Georgina. I really appreciate their uh, thinking about me and their nomination and thank you for stepping in in their case. So the question is, you know, when did helicobacter start to decline? And there's evidence that it began to decline uh, well before antibiotics began being used. Maybe it was a result of clean water or smaller families. Antibiotic use and misuse has definitely helped that along. And as it's been declining, uh, idiopathic ulcer disease, gastric cancer have been declining too. So that, that part is good news. Okay, so um, do you find it difficult then to convince um, gastroenterologists and clinicians in general that it's, it's a good idea to, for us to be infected by some pathogens? Well, you see, if you're, if you're just looking at the pathogens, then helicobacter is, is a bad guy. But we began doing studies on esophageal reflux, or GORD, as you call it, and we realized that there was an inverse relationship with HP. And then we studied Barrett's esophagus, a pre-malignant condition, and adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Both are sequelae of GORD, and they were inversely related to the presence of helicobacter also. And then we found that during the time that helicobacter has been disappearing, all these diseases were increasing in incidence quite markedly. So all the data fit and they were internally consistent with the hypothesis that helicobacter protects the esophagus and that its disappearance is fueling these diseases. So we're, we're seeing that helicobacter has its costs in the stomach and its benefits in the esophagus. And then because Gord is sometimes related to asthma, we studied that too. And again, we found inverse relationships of H. pylori with asthma, especially childhood onset asthma. 
We found this in three large independent blinded studies. The results were robust. Others have found the same thing. And then we found uh, Helicobacter was inversely related to hay fever. And all this suggested that the mechanism for protection was immunological. And our ideas built on the work of Karen Robinson, which showed that HP recruits T cells to the stomach, especially T regulatory cells. And in experimental models, Ann Mueller's lab showed that Helicobacter specifically recruits T reg cells, which are protective against mouse asthma. So we've been working with Ann, and we continue to show in experimental systems that HP presence in the stomach changes the immunologic milieu in the lung. So both the epidemiologic data in humans and the experimental models are quite consistent. So it's on, these, on this kind of scientific basis that we think that Helicobacter is a mixed story, that it, it has cost and it has benefit. But uh, as, as you asked, then, you know, what's going on in the world? And uh, uh, there's been a lot of resistance to these ideas uh, in the GI community, which has been very surprising to me. I think it's because the H. pylori field is ideologically controlled uh, in gastroenterology. And after first resisting that HP was related to ulcers, now they're born again and affirm that HP is always a bad guy and must be eliminated. But I think their practice of medicine is overreaching the, the trail of evidence. Right now, most doctors are searching for and destroying HP. The indication for treatment is the presence of the organism. This is unsupported by the primary data. Uh, but supported by many so-called consensus panels. So I think the power of dogma is strong. And I think the current practice of GI and really extending into primary care in relation to this field, they're deeply in the grip of dogma. Okay, thanks. Okay. So um, to return to the fascinating concept of these missing microbes from the microbiota, I mean, we do know that fecal transplants can be very effective in the treatment of C. diff infection, but replenishing the gut microbiota with these missing microbes is a, is a very different proposition. I mean, how realistic do you think this approach is? And indeed, could it even be dangerous? Yeah, well, that's a great question or a great series of questions. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as you point out, uh, the story of C. diff establishes that FMT works. It's a proof of principle. But FMT, we know the cause, it's a relatively acute problem, uh, and the results have been terrific. But now if you talk about a disease like uh, inflammatory bowel disease or obesity, something that's been going on for decades, and we don't really understand the cause, uh, it, it, it's a long shot that FMT is gonna work. I think we have to do much more science to understand really what's going on, understand the heterogeneity in the groups. Yeah. And furthermore, it's one of the reasons that we're concentrating on studies of children, because I, I think that the diathesis is formed early in life. And, uh, and there's evidence that if kids are overweight, they're gonna be overweight when they're, uh, when they're adults too, even more overweight. So we're, we're really concentrating early. That's where we think we have the best chance to reverse things or pre prevent things primarily and maybe reverse. I mean, how widely do you think that this potential impact of early antibiotics on the microbiota is going to be accepted by clinicians and, and could more be done, should more be done? You know, I, I think that we're, we're, we're all living in a kind of mirage and that's, that's why I call this antibiotics at the crossroad. We've been so, antibiotics are so powerful and they're so in general free of short-term benefits, uh, short-term risks that we've, we've kind of given it a blind eye, like that these are miraculous drugs and we should use them whenever possible. But there's more and more evidence that they have long-term cost. Now, if somebody is really sick, they must have antibiotics. But a lot of the antibiotic use is in very minor illnesses. This is part of the reason there's so much variability in antibiotic use. So in those cases, what, what I think we're getting is that we're getting the the cost of antibiotics without much benefit. So we, we have to really steward the use of antibiotics much better. So we're treating people who need them and, and we, we save them and we save the cost uh, 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 from our populations. Yeah. Again, I suppose thinking about the sort of natural, normal microbiota colonization, I mean, how can we clearly explain to parents and carers 
the fundamental difference between the avoidance of the harmful pathogen by targeted hygiene and the need for sort of the healthy exposure to useful and necessary microbes. I mean, how do we get that message across of that distinction? Well, you, you know, I'm a scientist and I say the, the message has to come from science, from scientific studies, mm -hmm. studies in humans, uh, in children, studies in uh, relevant animal models, uh, clinical trials. So uh, I think that eventually uh, we're, we're gonna tip the thing. It, it, this reminds me of the discussion 40 years ago, 50 years ago about climate change. People were wondering about that. How, how could turning on the ignition in your car cause the ice cap in Greenland to melt? But there's, as we know, unfortunately, there's more and more evidence of this. And you know, antibiotics are such powerful agents. How could we think that there wasn't gonna be a cost? Yeah. So we have, to, we have to do the science and then take the science uh, to, to, the, to the people. Yeah, we have to get the message out there. Okay, Marguerite, would you like to carry on? So in your opinion, how do you think the current pandemic has affected people's perceptions and opinions about infection? Well, uh, I, I think, you know, everything about COVID is complex. And uh, I'd say in the first case, people are beginning to understand how important are microbes to human health. In this case, in the bad sense is pathogens. But it also means we have to be more respectful of nature vis-a-vis -vis infections. And COVID is teaching people about ecology and about microbial evolution. It's also teaching how we can solve problems if we really try to. On the one hand, it's making people more germophobic. On the other hand, it's making people more aware, maybe more respondent to an understanding of how the human and microbial worlds are linked. So it, it, and a very interesting question, which is still unresolved, is whether the microbiome status or particular features affect the risk of serious infection to COVID. We're working on that question right now, and I know others are as well. Sheila, do you want one last question? Okay, um, so a sort of more generic one. Looking back on your career, which of your many, many achievements are you most happy with and why? Well, I, for me, it, it's certainly the students and fellows and colleagues uh, who I've worked with and tried to help over the years and who have accomplished so much. And one of the great things about the modern practice of science is that it's a group effort and it is so much fun. Uh, working with other people as a team, each contributing in different ways, seeing the progress in the individual studies and seeing the progress across the trainee's career. Th these are really have been very important to me. And when all the experiments fail for a period, it's great to remember the human side and the intrinsic value of what we're doing in training the next generation of scientists. Absolutely, absolutely agree with you. Thank you. Okay, Marguerite, do you want to wind up? So, okay, unfortunately, we, we, we run out of time. We could talk all, that, all evening with you, Martin. But once again, I'd like to thank you for a really wonderful presentation uh, and really food for thought. Um, and thank you very much and, and congratulations on your prize once again, uh, well deserved. Yeah, and can I remind you. everybody, uh, thank you for uh, tuning in and listening to us. Um, and can I remind you that the recording of this session will be available on the virtual event platform from the 5th of May and it'll be there for up to a month. Uh, and also remind you that coming up next, there are no less than eight poster sessions to choose from. <laughs> So, which all start now at half six. So just make your way back to the platform and select the session that you wish to attend. And I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>